is Vas. Uh, I'm a, an advanced uh, practitioner for um, for pigs, so I'm working mainly in community pain services. Um, my journey here started um, about nine months ago, Lily. When was it? A year ago? I don't know. I don't remember. But anyway, recently. Um, because I felt that um, as a service, we we would benefit a lot by having students, uh, student placements. My first contact with student placements um, happened when I was working at Tigs Milk Hospital, and I was thinking like, why we were not doing the same thing? Um, one of the reasons to do behind that was that I felt that pain services and pain management should be should be made aware to students far earlier than it's currently done. And one of the things that I discussed with Leanne and with Jen um, when we spoke is that actually students don't know about this career option, this career pathway until much, much later into their career. And partially that could contribute to, you know, why pain management is not is not as effective as we would like is because people don't really understand this concept uh, from early on and we spend so much time treating pain management and with people having seen physiotherapists and other practitioners and having had the typical treatment when they should be having pain management all along and from the beginning but beyond that as a service i thought that we could benefit and we could also benefit patient uh, participants as well and uh, participants students as well so i discussed that and um, I'm not sure how it started, Leanne. I think somebody linked you with me or linked me with you and uh, we kind of get it going. Um, and I had my first, um, I was um, supervisor of one student so far and we started in uh, September. September? No, no, January, sorry. <laughs> I have lost the track of time. So we started January uh, for an eight week placement and uh, to my satisfaction, it was uh, actually a great experience. Uh, all the problems that I initially thought that I might have, none of that happened. And we ended up having a quite good experience. The student was also very satisfied, good experience with them as well. They actually, the whole placement achieved that aim that actually made them aware of this career pathway. And they said in their feedback, actually, this is what happened. We didn't know that this is something that we could do in the future. And me being in that placement, following that pathway was actually a very enlightening experience. And she, she says that actually, you know, this puts things into perspective in terms of future career because most of them they come out thinking that either I'm going to work in an outpatient department or within an inpatient department doing you know conventional physiotherapy or I will go out there and I will do sports physiotherapy for a team for football for 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 whatever basically none of them is coming out there thinking that you know there is like this biopsychosocial model that I can actually practice we teach them about that at the university but none of them has seen actually why, what it is and how treatment along those lines is and um, I think it was very successful. Ho we're hoping for the next one, but you know, there are some limitations there. The, there is a little bit of, um, you know, for this to circulate a little bit um, longer, more universities to become aware of this. So far, we had only from Sheffield Hallam University, but eventually we would like to also have from other people. The one of the biggest problem is that. I am the only one doing it at the moment, so that was also an incentive for my colleagues as well to see how this is done. So hopefully soon somebody else will step forward and say, well, I also want to do that. I also want to supervise someone and hopefully having more than just one, because my problem is that I'm working part time clinically, part time academically, and that doesn't allow me the time to actually focus on this and say, OK, I can have more than one student. Uh, that's it, I think. <laughs> any Thank any you. questions you have, I'm happy to answer. Thank you for that, Baz. That's really helpful. I will share my screen with you and we'll just bear with me. I say I'll share my screen with you. I will do. Bear with me. There we go. Can we all see that? Yeah. So yeah, I can see that, Jen. Fab. 
So just to start with, I just talk, talk through some of the learning outcomes for today's session. I know we're still waiting on some people, but if we've recorded it, then obviously the people can watch it afterwards, which is great. So really it's to be aware of the national issues around the physiotherapy workforce, to understand your role in influencing workforce transformation for physiotherapists, to understand how physiotherapy placements could work in the context of primary care, to identify and problem solve potential barriers, and also to share concerns for escalation back to the AHP faculty. So just to paint the national picture, then I'm sure most of you are aware already, but the profession needs to meet the demands of, of the long term plan. And we see this kind of moving towards prevention and place based care. And we'll start to see a shift of allied health professions moving into into primary care, as well as still having those those demands and needs for secondary care as well. And the CSP latest figures say they want to need to increase the profession by 23% by the year 2035. And to some extent, that's kind of easier said than done at the moment, particularly after after COVID, um, because we can see that they're trying to do this by increasing number of places on on physio courses. But then obviously we need the extra placements to help deliver that. Um, we're doing this also by looking at return to practice and international recruitment. But also we're seeing at the moment that a lot of people are starting to leave the profession. Um, I think the King's Fund latest data was like 94,000 vacancies in the NHS at the moment, which is absolutely staggering. And that's just getting higher and higher as time goes on. Um, and we see this within our own integrated care system as well. We can see the data that people are leaving within the year between March 2020 to 2021. 31 AHPs left uh, the ICS within their first year of practice. And again, there was another peak of more than that, leaving in three to five years after like starting their profession as well, which is really sad. And people weren't leaving necessarily to relocate or go to other jobs. Some of these are leaving the NHS completely and um, going to other professions and stating issues like work life balances being being the issues. But obviously, to meet the needs of the long term plan, we need to look at the changing roles and extended scope of practice that that's developing too and I'm sure you know better than me that obviously first contact practitioners, advanced clinical practitioners are all coming out of this as well and also the change to more digital technology use and kind of when treating patients. So Health Education England have set some aims to help achieve all of this. Um, they aim to increase um, capacity applications and acceptance onto AHP courses to support the delivery of the long term plan. But to do that, we need to increase clinical placements to be able to support that. To maximise undergraduate and returning workforce supply through planned and sustained career and return to practice work. And it's important to make sure that we're looking at student attrition as well. We know several students leave the course before they even graduate, which is really sad, and they're less than people coming into our workforce. They want to modernise roles and ways of working in line with the people plan. And that's things looking at um, flexible and remote working, looking at how we use technology um, to help with our treatment of patients. Uh, and they're all things that it's really good for students to experience whilst on placement and see those different roles and different ways of working. And also to build significant placement expansion, innovation and resilience. And they're looking at developing a fair share model to implement across the region. So we know more physiotherapy placements are, are coming to primary care with this fair share model. So this is where people come in with the workforce transformation. This is why placements across primary care are really important. So that graduates can meet the needs of developing services and new ways of working. And just like as has already said, having those experiences of seeing different ways of working, different aspects of the profession are really important. And especially when that comes to knowledge of job opportunities and areas for future practice. We recognise these may be not jobs that new band fives are going to go straight into, but giving people the knowledge of those different career paths and different ways that they could go in the future is really beneficial. And there's also those benefits to recruitment. What I've found recently uh, through some of my work is surveys of saying people saying, where, where would you want to work when you graduate? And a lot of places that people just haven't heard of, and that puts them off, um, puts them off applying to places. So um, if people have heard of the the area they're working in, if people know about the different roles, people are much more likely to, to apply and there's definitely benefits there to recruitment. Also, just to share that there's other ways to support students as well. 
such as role emerging placements. Um, we're setting a few up at the moment with, in, with companies who don't have a physiotherapist on board. And so it's really an exciting area to stretch for placements really and give students different opportunities. But that also creates a need for long term, long arm supervisors who can support students virtually uh, because they need to be marked by a physiotherapist. And if there's no physiotherapist, physiotherapist in the place where they're working and uh, it creates a need for long arm supervisors. So that is another way that people can get involved with supporting students as well. Now, Vaz has already given his, his lovely best practice example. Thank you very much. So we'll, unless there's anything else you want to say, Vaz, do you, shall we move on to Rowena to talk through Lincoln and their... Um, so, Rowena, is this a good time for you to talk with your little one, Paulie? Are you all right? Uh, he is moaning. And, he's on my lap and he's moaning and groaning, so I do apologise. <laughs> I'm trying to get him back off to sleep. Hi everybody, um, I'm Marina Burgess, I'm the programme lead, hopefully you can hear me all right, I'm the programme lead for the University of Lincoln. Um, so for those of you that um, don't know, um, at the University of Lincoln we have um, one pre-registration physiotherapy programme, so it's an MSc um, pre-registration programme. It is a two-year programme um, so students will have done um, a relevant degree before and we have a January start date and we run through from January through to December um, for two years. Um, we are looking at slightly changing our a start date for 2023 to come in line with other postgraduate programmes in the university. So. Um, from next year we'll put, we'll be starting at the end of January beginning of February um, which will change things slightly um, but I have just put hopefully you can see it okay um, uh, a planner on um, the screen on the slides and um, so the yellow blocks are I guess the important bits for you guys to know there are our placement blocks so um, currently we have three placements in each year so three in year one and three in year two and they are all five weeks um, in length apart from the first one which we um, shortened to four weeks. Um, <clears throat> the um, other thing to say is in terms of um, modules um, we have um, four shared modules on our program out of eight modules so all the modules are core there's no optional modules for the students in year one they um, do a shared module which is called essential interprofessional practice um, and then they do uh, three um, physio modules um, applied sciences and physiotherapy essential physiotherapy practice and assessment and clinical judgment in physiotherapy and then in year two we have three shared modules so they're shared against occupational therapy nursing and hopefully speech and language therapy from next year um, and that is applied health improvement service evaluation service transformation and then um, the physiotherapy module is a long module that kind of runs through the whole year and that's advanced in physiotherapy practice um, I don't know what else you want me to say. <laughs> yeah. Please ask questions. Um, Next we, slide, Rowena. Yeah, you can do that. It's just kind of got the modules um, and the credits. Um, so in terms of placements, we have just moved to the CPAF. So the Common Placement Assessment Form that's been developed by the CSP, um, which is a standardised placement form. Um, so hopefully uh, many HEIs uh, are going to be adopting that. I know some of you are already using it on the call. Um, and I think that's given us the freedom to ex um, sort of try out and explore um, different placements, um, which we're very keen to do. Um, our form before was a bit more restrictive in terms of being more sort of physiotherapy patient facing placements um, whereas the CPAF allows for those kind of different placements and like Jen was talking about those role emerging placements. Um, so students are currently out on placement at the moment, um, our, our year two ones and this is the first time we've used the CPAF so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Um, 
in terms of next year with the move to a um, different start date we are also and um, placement capacity um, we are looking to change our placement models and go um, from six placements to four so have um, four longer placements um, so there'll be the seven or eight weeks um, two in each year and again we're also um, we've also got international students for the first time on our program this year so um, we're hoping those longer placements will also help our international students um, embed on the placements I think five weeks or four weeks is quite a short term sometimes for the students feel they're only just sort of getting started so that's kind of where we are at at the University of Lincoln I don't know if there's any specific questions for me or the program or how it runs There are no hands up or anything, Jen. Thank you. I was going to say, I can't see hands here. I can't see hands, so I promise to be hand monitored. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marina. That's okay. We... Thank you. I'm going to probably turn my mic and um, camera off again now. I am here. <laughs> uh, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, shall we move on to Sue then at Sheffield Hallam University? I say that, but my. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. I'm afraid I've got a few more slides than um, than than Rowena, but a lot of a lot of the a lot of the points sort of um, a lot of similarities of um, of um, points to make really. So yeah, so we have three programs at Sheffield Hallam. We've got the regular three year BSc. Um, we've also got um, the degree apprenticeship BSc course, um, and um, and like Lincoln, we've got the pre reg masters course. So so we have January entries for for the apprenticeship and the MSc and then September for the BSc. So our numbers are, as you can see, significantly higher um, than than Lincoln um, and, and and I think Nottingham still as well. So so those so our placements are generally within Yorks and Humber and East Midlands. So we do overlap with with both Nottingham and and Lincoln. I haven't got um I haven't got a, a course plan because we for for those three courses you can imagine we have got um we've got placements going on all the time I think there's probably two weeks at the end of August where we we only got one cohort out but generally we have two cohorts out at at any one time and in the summer July and August time we we do our catch up placements for those students um who who haven't completed a placement or have failed placement so they have to catch up with the placements in the summer before they start their next academic year. So we can just move on to the next slide. Um, thanks. So for the BSc, um, they have a, traditionally a placement experience at the end of year one, um, two in year two and two in year three, and they're all various lengths between four and eight weeks for, for these students. Um, we aim probably the same as, as all courses for, for a variety of experiences. Um, in inpatients, outpatients community. We are diversifying. We've had quite a few academic placements, research placements and leadership placements this year. And we do offer self-sourcing as an option. So that could be out of our area or overseas. So, so we've had a few students have gone back to their home country to complete a placement. And some students have been lucky enough within the UK to source a placement close to home or close to an area that they, or, or within an area that they're keen to develop. And I know that one of our students is currently in communication with Vaz about maybe doing one um, in, in, their, in, their second, in their second year um, in pain. She's, She's she's done a previous degree and is is, is very interested in in pain management. So um, so hopefully that's that's going to um, develop and, and be a confirmed placement. We do normally say that that students shouldn't be approaching anybody within our patch. So I do apologise, Vaz. That that sort of it hasn't gone according to plan. But but often things don't do they with placements. <laughs> so so um, we with the BSc are moving towards um, using bringing in the path. In sept from September onwards, our BSc students have a 40% pass mark, and we are actually, when we introduce the CPATH, are moving towards a pass fail for our BSc students, which is the same as we have for the MSc students, but their pass mark is 50. And the reason we've introduced it um, is that we feel that 
having experienced the MSE students with the pass fail, that they are concentrating on what they're learning and they're concentrating on their own development rather than I want 70%, I've got to get a first on this placement, um, which a lot of our BSc students do. So, so we've decided to, to go for it and, and see, what, see what happens. The other thing that is different, the um, first year block this year, we're trialling it and it's going to be a university based placement experience rather than out in, in you know, what was traditionally a clinical experience. Um, and, and so it's, it's going to be very heavily um, led by clinician input. We've got actors coming along to be service users. We've got taster sessions from a variety of um, perhaps smaller placement areas, so paediatrics are doing some, some stuff. So I think thinking about what Vaz said earlier about students not being aware of pain management, that's the, that's the sort of experience, you know, a little taster of a lot of things we, we want to put in these this sort of university um, based experience so that students have a bit of an understanding of the profession, but also they have an opportunity to start developing those really, really core skills, the communication, talking to patients, taking notes, understanding the bigger picture um, about, about physiotherapy. So, so we're trialling it this summer. We're looking for long arm support. We're looking for people to be involved to either deliver sessions um, and to help assess the students at the end of this placement. So I think we've sort of shared that quite widely. So that, that sort of, um, in a nutshell, is our BSc course. Um, Am I able to just click on Jen to the next one or can you, could you, that's lovely. So for the degree apprenticeship course, all of the degree apprenticeship students have, um, they are employed um, as either physio assistants or TIs and they traditionally were quite local, but now we've got students from all over the country and what they do, um, they have sort of blocks of six weeks, whether they're at uni, whether they're on the job at home or on placement. So, so they, they rotate between those three. We currently have just 20 odd um, physio students and there's a few more OT students. So like, like Rowena said, the, 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 uh, there is integrated learning within all our courses and um, they do work together. Um, there is no placement tariff that follows the degree apprenticeship students, unfortunately. So I know for some providers that that sort of doesn't fit, they, they don't want to offer us um, degree apprenticeship placements. But what we're sort of trying to arrange is reciprocal partnerships. And I think probably all of you um, involved or the trust involved in the call now, I think you have reciprocal agreements with, with your degree apprenticeship students that you offer a variety of placements for those students and you share them between. So in some areas it's working really well in other areas. So we have a student from Swindon and they're out there on their own and, and actually getting placements for that student is a bit of a challenge at the moment. But I suspect we're going to see a lot more degree apprenticeship courses, aren't we, um, developing, um, you know, with the with long term um, plan. Um, so if we move on to the next one. Thanks, Jen. So again, I think I've probably said probably said um, most of these points, but like um, Rowena's, the pre-reg um, master students have all come in with a, a 2-1 in a, in a relevant subject um, at BSc level. So all their academic work is, is marked at masters, but their placements are marked at undergraduate level. So they only get sort of one credit per placement. And then on to, have I got another slide? The last okay. one. Um, we're introducing CPAF, pass fail, um, the diversity we've mentioned all of those the only other point to add is that we've we've um, got two new practice learning coaches who are involved in our placement team and they're they're hopefully giving added value to the student experience and the educator experience so they're not physios by background one's a PE uh, was a PE teacher and, an, and the other um, was was did an awful lot of um, research on her PhD into cancer um, and, and things so so they're not that they're, 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 they've got a whole host of skills but they're not physiotherapists but they're supporting the students in their skill development on placement and um, it seems to be going really really well and the university is looking at rolling out that this this practice learning um, coach role across um, across the college so so that they they are there to support the, the students in addition to academic advisors and academic staff and also to support those that are providing the placements as well and I think that's everything thank you <laughs> any questions lovely any hands I can't see any hands sorry 
Thanks, Jen. That's fine. No, just thank you, Sue. Um, Julia, did you want to talk through what's happening at the University of Nottingham? Let me just unmute myself. Um, well, at Nottingham, I always thought, well, it's a relatively straightforward course, but like Sue has spoken to now and Rowena, I mean, the, the changes that needs to happen as for, for the reasons you mentioned, Jen, is, yeah, we always feel that I'm, we're changing and developing and bringing more stuff in. So there is at the moment we're going through curriculum change and this because of the CSP needs to create a new curriculum change. So things are changing, but this is how things stand at the moment. Um, so just in general to talk about our course, it is a BC course for three years. In their first year, they're looking at the pathophysiology, neuromusculoskeletal things like anatomy, physiology, then musculoskeletal disorders and diseases. But then they're also starting to think what it is going to be to be a physio. So continuing professional development and also evidence-based practice. And on the slides, saying how many careers it counts and how they get assessed and all details in there. You might not be that interested in it. For year two, um, we're thinking more now, they're becoming a physio, they're actually starting clinical placements now as well. So we're thinking more about how you manage cardiorespiratory issues, how you manage musculoskeletal issues and neuro issues. And then we also have a module in of long-term uh, um, long term conditions and that is then incorporating all of the above really as well. And then they start to think about the research methods and planning and some more CBD. And then in year three, um, they what we have at the moment still is how we give them option modules in this third year that they can decide what they're interested in and would like to know more of. So the option modules we have do change for, it depends on what staff we have available and what we can give in a year. Um, it's normally co covers cardio, respiratory things, pediatrics, neuro, um, also management of pain, exercise science. And because we're working with the sports rehab is, is they, do a course with us um, and they start in their first year it's actually with the physio students but in the second year they split away but in the third year they will do option modules that's similar again like the disability in sport for example and exercise in sport um, then they do their dissertation the biggest credit bearing module and more continuing professional development and they have the four clinical placements. So our clinical placements do cover a we do cover a wide range like Lincoln and Sheffield as well. Um, can I get the next slide Jen please? Um, so as my Sheffield and, Link and Lincoln is covering probably also looking for placements in the same geographical area. And for us, that's more in the middle. It's quite difficult sometimes to get place to use placements in Lincolnshire that's far away, like Louth, for example, or or in Chesterfield. So if if Sue or Ruina wants to swap any placements that's coming up in May, please let me know because we do have offers that we would like to swap maybe with you. Um, so we we have a placement support team that support us allocating, sourcing and allocating the placements. Um, and then we have a 
placement team that's supporting students, but the, that placement team is, for some reason, we were four not so long ago, and that's down to one, me now. <laughs> um, and But our job role is basically to moderate the assessment process because, I don't know if that's coming up in a later slide, but we do have assess placements at the moment. And interesting to listen to Sue and Rowena about assessing students and pass fail because we are currently going through the process of deciding what do we want to happen with placements. We are using the CPAF since October this October, October last year, and but we, we're looking at if we're going for pass fail or marked placements. At the moment, it is still marked. Jen, can I have the next slide that I can see what's on there, please? <laughs> so our types of placement experience is really is everywhere, and we like Sheffield and Lincoln as well, we're looking at new placement opportunities all the time. And I know Zoe has worked very hard with Leanne and Jen to try and find different placement, different placement experiences. So at the moment, we're sending our students onto NHS settings, sport clubs and clinics. And we're also looking at virtual placements. COVID has taught us that we can do things virtually as well. And we're looking at long-arm long supervision possibilities as well. So then they're covering, we're hoping that they will all cover the normal areas of physio, of cardio, respiratory, neuro, MSK. But then we're also looking at research and academic-based ba um, placements project-based placements and public health placements. That's all new things, new types of placements that's coming in. So in our, um, to sum up really is, there's one more slide, Jen, I think. Sorry, I don't know the slides very well. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, in year one, we're not sending them out on placement, but we are trying to give them normally a placement experience, a shadow visit, that they can at least get an idea of what a hospital or physio is like. So we're having observational inside placements. In year two, they have four placement blocks. And again, that's what Rowena and um, Sue said as well about the timings of placements we are looking into having slightly longer placements in the future because four weeks is really quick. Um, because at the moment we're doing four week placements in year two and year three, and then we have an elective placement experience of three weeks as well. So in total, they get 11 weeks of placements over the three years. But that's me. Any, any Thank questions? Thank you, Julia. Now we're going to move on to having a conversation about how placements can work in your area. But Leanne, can you tell me, has anybody else joined us? No, just the originals, Jen. No. So there may not be a great discussion here, um, but I was wondering, without wanting to put Karen on the spot too much, I know that uh, you've just accepted to have two students, haven't you, in May and I don't know if you wanted to perhaps talk about um, the way you're going to manage that placement because it sounds quite interesting. Yeah so um, I'm one of the clinical leads I job share with um, Anna Van who can't be with us today for the first contact practitioner service in Nottingham City and um, so we're kind of attached to the Mosaic service who deliver MSK and pain services in Nottingham City and take quite a lot of students um, but mainly from Nottingham um, but we haven't so far really had um, students within FCP um, as yet I think we've had a couple of students who've spent a little bit of time with a clinician who has a split role but we certainly haven't had anyone who's solely been solely been based in FCP as yet and um, one of the reasons for that being that um, the clinics are quite 
time pressured so there's sort of 20 minute appointments with not a lot of um admin time in between um because the the gp practices are um paying for those services it would be difficult for us to block a lot of appointments out of those clinics to spend time with the student because that's not really part of the contact that contract that's been agreed with the GP practices. Um, so as yet we haven't um sort of we haven't really taken students with an FCP. Um, but we are planning on taking um two students from Nottingham, I believe, starting at the beginning of May as a pilot. Um, they're going to spend three days um, within an FCP within FCP clinics and then a couple of days on project work. Um, so within their FCP time, I think there is a plan that they will spend a little bit of time in shadowing some of the other members of the primary care team to get a greater understanding of the role and how everybody kind of works together. Um, we hope that by having two together um, that they can sort of support each other, um, that there'll be some time for practical, um, some time for observation, some time for the students to sort of discuss and reflect between the two of them on either what they've done or what they've seen and have some chance to, to practice things together. Um, and we're hoping that that may overcome some of the um, issues with their educator not being able to perhaps block an appointment to go through doing X, Y and Z that they've got a bit of time to practice with each other as well. Um, so so that's how the kind of the clinical side of things will work. And then the project based um, side of the placement um, it's sort of being facilitated by myself and Anna Ban. And um, what we were wanting to do was work on some sort of shared resources for the team um, to that they can send very quickly to patients within clinic via a sort of SMS message. So sourcing so self-management um, leaflets or producing those if there isn't anything that already exists, sourcing some good videos um, and explainers, those kinds of things that can be um, distributed to patients and that those can then be kept and used by the clinicians once the students have have left. So that is our, our plan. Um, we've got one of our clinicians is quite keen on um, has, has been quite keen to, to take this forward in terms of being the main educator and um, they're quite experienced um, within the service um, and yeah I think we're just planning on getting quite a bit of feedback at the end of the placement from the student and also the staff who've been involved um, in the placement as well as to um, how they how they feel it's gone really and trying to sort of review and change things as we go along. Thank you, Karen. That sounds a really exciting opportunity for students. Does, Vaz, did you have any experience of barriers that you came up against when you were planning your placement? Um, no, but that might be, be down to the fact that my student was quite keen and she was basically a yes person. I don't know if this would be translated in the future with other students, but some of the barriers that I discussed early on with Leanne were, were um, traveling. OK, so we don't have a single base. Uh, I happen to work uh, at a single place for the last year or so, and that was down to the pandemic. Before the pandemic, I was much more mobile than I, than I am now. I was traveling to different clinics, so it worked quite well. Um, so that might apply to you. Um, well, sorry, what's your name, uh, Karen? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was basically with a patient a single day per week, and I was monitoring everything. So I was with a patient every 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 Monday, and I was having feedback about how the previous week went on. Then what I was planning the week ahead. There was already a plan, but you know, sometimes people were on annual leave and so on and so on. So I had to change things sometimes. But anyway, so I was planning ahead and I tried to make it as diverse as possible. 
Now, um, it worked quite well. The barrier could be traveling. Uh, my student had her own car, which was quite well. She didn't have an issue. Most of the clinics were close to her home anyway, because she was living somewhere like in the middle. So anywhere I was asking her to go, she was not she was fine to go. A, pay, a student with um, not a car that might have found that challenging. So that can be a potential barrier, okay, particularly since we're work, we are working in the community. Another barrier could be. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult, really. Uh, it's difficult because um, I cannot see anything else being a problem, uh, but that might be because I'm very opt optimistic. <laughs> um, sometimes if things were were cancelled at the last minute or somebody was on a sick leave and that was not planned or another barrier that could be was that some of the people. So if you want to make it diverse, you have to take into account the, the working patterns of different clinicians. So some people work full time, some people work, work part time, some people work full day, some people work half day. So if you want to make it diverse, there is a chance that actually <clears throat> some of the people would, would work half days. So you would have to adjust for the second half of the day when there is no clinic. So if there is like a clinic nearby or somebody else is doing something else that is easily adjustable, but this was not always the case. So the thing that I did was very early on, I had I had an idea that this is going to happen. So I said to the to the student, OK, you had like a week with us already. What is the that is the most interesting thing to you in terms, you know, of a condition, of a process, of a treatment, whatever that is. She ended up having fibromyalgia. So I asked her to just prepare an essay, basically, like two, three day, three pages essay about the topic, like pathophysiology treatment and, you know, um, prognosis, whatever, a, a basic, a generic one, which she had the time to develop through the whole placement. And I marked it in the end. That was quite good. Okay, this worked quite well, and um, we asked the student as well if we didn't have the time to ask them to be at base where they could meet 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 everybody else, um, participate in telephone contacts like post injection reviews, things like that. So a barrier could be that this might not be possible all the time. It might be challenging if there is traveling involved. Uh, it depends a lot on how keen the student is, and uh, it depends also a lot on working patterns of our colleagues. Um, something else that could be a barrier would be, I think this is down to the to each instructor um, to identify early on what is the personal interest of each student. OK, so this is from my point of view, this is not an outpatient department when you know what comes in and you know what comes out, you know your working patterns, you know everything. The student that I have, the first one was quite broad and quite interested about everything, so that was not a problem. The second student that has approached me as, um, sorry, sorry, forget the names, Dale. Uh, Sorry, what's the name? <laughs> Sue. So as Sue said, she has a psychology background, which early on she said to me, I am interested in this biopsychosocial. So I know already that I'm going to focus more on the biopsychosocial treatment and the pain management groups rather than focusing on the assessments and the triaging I did with the first student. I think this is something that we need to take into consideration when we plan this because we can very easily adjust if you have many options we can easily adjust to the patient and make it much more interesting to them so a barrier could be personal interests of the students which we need to identify so we should not treat students as uh, you know like all all of them are the same all of them are going to receive exactly the same thing because uh, in my experience this is not working very well if we make it more diverse and that's partially one of the reasons why i asked to have one because if it is down to me i can I can personalize it, tailor it as much as I want and focus on anything that I need. I could potentially do it for a second one, but that is going to get a little bit more complex. Finally, and sorry that I, I have the, this monologue because I, I'm going to go soon. Um, a small barrier, but not a big problem, was communica communicating with the university, not in a sense of day to day stuff. I was aware that there had to be two meetings, two, two contacts, one in the middle of the placement, the other one at the, at the end of the placement. That was quite challenging to arrange 
And uh, I don't think that this needs to be the case. There has to be some kind of way to move around that. So on my clinical time, it's very, very hard for me to find the 20, 30 minutes to actually have a phone call like that. OK, so I would have on the first time I had to call outside of my working hours to make this happen. Which is fine, but I don't think that this would be the case like as a standard. And the second telephone call, I had to do it outside of my clinical hours. So I did it during my university time, which again is fine, but this is not this is not should not be. So I think there has to be a, a way of making this. I don't know. Does it really need to be a phone call? Can it be? Emails, can it be like a standard form where you can fill? Obviously, a form is not good, not for everyone, but I mean, if there is not a possibility to have a telephone con conversation, I think this is something that we need to take into account. But beyond that, my experience was quite good. My experience was quite good. I didn't find many barriers, but as I said, the sample size is quite small. The next student or the student after that might be might have different kind of patterns and might bring into the surface things that I have not really considered right now. So ask me next year, I would say. Oh, and one last thing. Time of the placement, this applies mostly to you, Julia, is like the duration of the placement is a big, very big barrier for me. So if you would approach me, I would say to you that for four weeks, I don't want a student with me because it will take the student at least two or three weeks to get an idea of what's happening. So having a student for like three, four weeks, getting them along, understand exactly what's the case, you know, with the, the complexity of the of the patients and, you know, getting how daunting that is and getting the confidence to actually go out and do stuff. And then it's, it's gone, it's done. So what am I going to assess for four weeks? So. I said also to my colleagues uh, at work that actually I would not do that for less than eight weeks. So because it's 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 not it's not worth the time, my time, and it doesn't worth the time of the student because I don't think that they will learn anything if it's like less than four, less than eight. Six can be a stretch, but um, when I was approached by the second student, um, so uh, I told her specifically that she told me like it's it's five or eight. Which one would you suggest? And I told her, not the five one. You're not going to have the chance to do anything. So this is something that needs to be taken into consideration from the university perspective. How much leeway there is for you to actually change the duration so you can attract people and in potentially allow more services to accept students. So automatically, as things, uh, if things are as you described, Julie, for me, I don't. I'm not going ever to accept anybody from your, from University of Nottingham. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Understandably, understandably. However, I have to throw in, we do want to give our students a wide range of experience. <laughs> and we are more than happy to offer it, but but we need to, to, to make it like very realistic and very serious. Otherwise, it's just, you know, a tick box. And I don't think that this should be a tick box. It shouldn't be a tick box experience. It should be something that has value. I think so. Uh, I'm going to go next, guys, because I realised halfway through that that I'm the hands up monitor and I've got my hand up, which is probably not the, the wisest thing I've ever done, is it? Um, but. Uh, linked to what Baz was just saying, so I for a few years have coordinated physiotherapy placements for Sherwood Forest Hospitals um, and now work within the ICS. I'm the HP faculty chair, so oversee GEN's work and see pet work in other professions, so OT, SLT and dietetics. And what I see everywhere is there's no kind of there's not a fixed time that suits absolutely everybody because Vaz is right when I look at the teams at Sherwood Forest some teams say exactly what Vaz is saying and they're like unless they're longer they really struggle to settle in and kind of get to grips with what we're doing for it to be meaningful um, and then some other teams go four weeks is great for us you know they can be in they can be out we're working on a lot of protocols you know that's great for us so I think as long as we all agree that there's a bit of a um uh, that there's a spread and that we're choosing placements which are most suited for our areas, then I think that's that's kind of OK, isn't it? Um, and certainly some teams really like the four week placements because it feels like not such a big time commitment. And, the, and in their team, they're not able to kind of 
provide that ongoing support for much longer. So I think Vaz, that's really important. And Vaz will remember that's the conversation I had with him when we first started looking at setting up placements with PICS. It was, you know, these are your options of our local universities. These are all the different lengths of placement. These are all the different programmes that you've all really presented beautifully on this call. Um, and actually what would fit better with your service rather than maybe thinking and, and obviously time of year and distance from where the student lives and that kind of thing all makes a difference, which is um, which is I kind of guess what Vaz has summarised. I wanted to share with you all just as a, a bit of an extension and I guess for Karen a little bit, just in case it's useful, that on the, um, so the AHP faculty has a website and it's hosted by NAS, Karen, which is the training hub that you'll be familiar with. Um, but on there, I'll share my screen in a second. On there, there is a placements page um, and it's got some resources. Now they are labelled to be for leadership placements, but they could be used for any kind of remote placement where they're doing project work. So I just wanted to share it with you so that you're not reinventing the wheel and producing resources that are potentially already there. Um, there are also, I'll just share the correct screen. I think this is the right one. Of course, you all disappear, so I can't see your faces when I share my screen, which I hate. Um, so if you just put NAF Nottingham into Google, you get and then click the HP faculty at the top, then you get the right page. And in placement resources, on this page there are various links to different bits and pieces but the bit in the middle around leadership placement there's a toolkit and an example of leadership placements but all of the resources themselves could be transferable to any kind of remote placement um, and Karen I have got some resources around things like having discussions around uh, preferred learning styles and personality types and that kind of thing which is quite nice if you're spending less one-to-one -one time with your patient uh, your students sorry I did have some students on my so it was my favorite leadership placement I must say um so this guy here and um another one of the students I had from SHU were with me for seven weeks um, and I used it with them and they were so such different characters with such different strengths and weaknesses and we used them with them and they loved them um, because we just had out on the table by the middle of the first week what our, what we liked, what we didn't like, how we worked best, how we like to communicate and we had a bit of a giggle doing it which is always quite nice I think when you've got students and you can build a bit of a rapport and I wouldn't have said that the kind of placement I did which was completely remote working would have been Alex's cup of tea ideally but I think he had an all right time. I think he had. I think he did enjoy it by the end. So I just wanted to share that with you. And there are some more resources coming out. So there's going to be um, an induction document which has got all the, you know, like timetables and all stuff like that on it to save you from reinventing the wheel. I know that Nancy's got a lot of that stuff for you, but um, it might just be a quite nice, quick and easy place for you to visit for ideas and things. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. Is it OK if I go? Unless, Karen, do you want to ask anything me? No, I no, I just put my hand up because I think I I see where you're coming from with you, the, the sort of the eight week and the longer placements. I know it's sometimes something that we say to students quite often is, oh, if you just had another whatever you'd be doing, you know, you'd be doing this. But also I feel like from a, just looking after our clinicians who at the moment are right on their, their edge in sort of FCP. They've got a lot of their own stuff they're trying to do with all the roadmap as well that I think if I ask them to do any more than four weeks, they might say no at the moment. Yeah. So I think it's nice to have a, a bit of a, a bit of a variety, I think, as well, because I think different things do see different, do see different areas, really. Um, yeah, but it's good to hear. Yeah, it's good to hear your experiences there as well. I don't think there is any way of of deciding how long placements need to be because there's pros and cons to any yeah. timing. Um, and yes, we, for quite a number of years, we've tried four weeks, and if people always say just a little bit longer, but yeah. um, so we're going to try the little bit longer. <laughs> But, but it will still not be eight weeks first. 
<laughs> Julia, it's exactly. the same for um, it's the same for rotations in organisations where they exist. So we started with four months. It wasn't long enough, so we went to six, and it's too long. So now we're at five. And I know that I'll live to see the day it goes back to four again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, so it's just one of those things, I think, isn't it? <laughs> if it comes down to that, then I could adjust, and I could I could make sure that you know um, I will exclude things that require more time to get to get you know to get yourself around and then focus on other things that are more straightforward like what i'm doing for example which i assess people which is more something that people are more confident and more basically aware or um, exposed i would say rather than something that it's very specialized and people have not seen it before if it's down to that i could adjust but four weeks it's practically impossible mm -hmm. five weeks six weeks mm, i could consider Eight weeks would be ideal, but like four weeks, still it's a no. But eventually, I'm happy to work around that problem and see how I can do it. All right. Anyway, I have to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vance. Feel Thanks, free to contact guys. me. Feel free to contact me with anything you need. All right. We will. Bye. 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 See you later. <laughs>
you know, if you're if the students are away for half a day, even shadowing that clinic, it just gives you a bit of a breather to catch up with some mm-hmm. bits, doesn't it? Um, and we, you know, you can create that at any point, but it is just nice to have that half day sometimes to go. I've just got to catch up on a few referrals and a few emails, and it's not that interesting for students to watch that sometimes, is yeah. it? It just give. I think it gives the students a little bit of a, a break as well. Yeah. Just that they're, they're they're learning, but in a different a different way yeah. as well, aren't they? And I think sometimes there's a bit of a concern from educators that if we, you know, if our students when they're on placement with us are going to shadow other teams, we worry a bit too much, don't we? That they the, that they think that's a bit rubbish. But actually, what I found is they really like that. They love to go in and have a nosy at what someone else is doing. And if I think mm. I've been a physio for twelve years. The last time I went and just shadowed someone and really learned about their roles was probably when I was a student. So you mm-hmm. don't really get those opportunities once you've been qualified in the same. Maybe I've popped to theatre a couple of times since I've been qualified, but you know, not I've not sat in clinics and done done that pure shadowing, which would be really interesting. When whenever we talk about placements, I just want to do them all. <laughs> when you were talking about yours, I thought that sounds really good. I'd like to come and do that. <laughs> we'll see what the students think <laughs> no I'm very thank you so much for that offer Karen <laughs> yeah I'll let you know how it goes I hope they yeah we're hoping that they'll give us sort of honest feedback so I think the thing that we're most concerned about is not having enough time to kind of explain things to them and them just feeling they kind of get rushed to, you know they sort of get rushed along Karen um, do do say to them from the beginning as well I think really you need to give us feedback we need to know how this placement is going because yeah from when we give them after the placement the, the thing they filled in is not going to be sufficient for your needs no, well, that's what we we're planning on ha- trying to on setting up a teams meeting with them before they start, so we can kind of give them a bit of an orientation like beforehand as to so that they feel a bit prepared and as, as to what's going to be involved, and that at the end that we have some that we have some discussion time with them, and that we just make it clear to them from the beginning that it's a pilot. So you know we're learning, so we want kind of honest feedback and if it's not working tell us so that we can see what we can do but I know sometimes like I hope they would I think we're all quite approachable so I would hope they'd feel comfortable to do that but sometimes people can feel a little bit like oh I shouldn't say x y and z so if that can be reinforced from the university end that might be quite nice that that they know that that um any feedback is is fine if um, Jen, it might be quite a nice idea if um, all goes well or people are happy or if there's just learning points to share, there's, we can put anything on that website. So if we want, you know, like clips of educators speaking and students giving feedback, especially when we're doing quite innovative stuff like primary care placements, we're keen to populate that website with lots of examples so that we can just signpost people mm-hmm. to it. So, you know, any any recording like that, was Sue, it was Sue, sorry, that really helpfully got Alex talking. Um, and I don't know how I didn't pin them down, Sue, because I had them for seven weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I didn't manage it. So, yeah, anything like that, If you even if it's just two minutes of them saying, you know, this was really good, but maybe in the future I'd like to see. It's good for you guys as well, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Guys.